Someone must have heard I was teaching and, and said that, uh, yeah, no. uh, danger Will Robinson, get out of here. We'll say five minutes from now, probably. <laughs> Somerville Standard Time, and five minutes after that. Hey, it's good to see all of y'all, and uh, it's good to see you all here, I mean here as opposed to over there. You know, right now I'm uh, rotating with, um, with Ben Green, and we're doing the class on uh, the um, C.S. Lewis stuff. And that's been a load of fun and had a great time. Now, my only regret is that most of the times that Ben has taught, I've either been gone or now I'm here, so I'm not getting to enjoy his great teaching today. He's doing the Chronicles of Narnia, finishing that up. Um, and uh, yeah, next week I'll be doing screw tape letters over there. So again, if you're interested in bouncing around, that's one nice thing about this particular class, doing the Psalms with a different teacher every week. Uh, every week is a one-off, you know, for the sake of summer when folks come and go. So, um, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about Psalm 19, and uh, I was going to say one of my favorites, there's about 150 of my favorites in Psalms, I'm a big, big fan of Psalms, the whole daily Bible reading thing that I always talk about, the usual um, uh, plan that I, that I use is uh, the one-year Bible which has a psalm reading every day, and you go through the psalms twice a year. Um, this year I'm doing, along with Ken, the, um, uh, the Lagarde Smith narrated Bible, so the psalms are mixed in where they appear in Scripture. Uh, but as part of my daily prayer time, I always read a psalm anyway. So I mean, I, I've, uh, I've not gone without a psalm of the day for many, many years. And, and Psalm 19 is actually one uh, that... Uh, the reason when, when I was going to sub in today that I chose this for our lesson is because Sunday morning, last week, uh, when I was at Poly Beach with my family, um, we you know, obviously did not want to leave the, the island and try to drive back to it in 4th of July traffic, so we had our family devotional um, you know, on the beach. And uh, this was uh, what came to my mind doing my morning reading that day. It was part of our devotional, and so I'm just going to repackage that for y'all with a little bit better visual aids. So uh, let's read together from God's Word. So Psalms, the psalmist opens up, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Now why do you think that was on my mind at Folly Beach? <laughs> you get all alone looking into the night sky. Oh, absolutely. I, I was, um, every morning, you know, I'm an early riser, and even though I slept in on vacation, I slept in until sunup, and as the sun began creeping over the horizon, you know, coming out of the Atlantic Ocean uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'd roll out and I'd grab my Bible and go to the back porch and watch the sun rise as the, um, as the waves rolled in, and for whatever reason, we were in a flight path for an absolute air crew of pelicans. They come over in, in formation and you actually see them change so where the front bird comes off to the back and, and keep on breaking the wind perfectly. Uh, but the pelicans were amazing except for there was one time when pelicans did in flight what pelicans do in flight. And, and uh, in all my years of going to the beach, I have never been bombarded by pelican poo. Uh, seagull, yes, the occasional pigeon, but I've now hit for the cycle. I've now been hit in the head with pumpkin poop, so there you go. But um, so the heavens declare the glory of God, and this leads us right back to the old argument from design, right? What, what, what is the argument from design? What, what is the argument for the existence of God that we call the argument from design? Anybody know? Yeah. Well, everybody follow yourselves at once. So. It's one of the easiest and earliest arguments about you know, the logical proofs of the existence of God. Just look, dummy, this couldn't be an accident. I read somewhere, uh, it, could, it had to be in the last month or else it wouldn't still be in the memory banks. Uh, somebody talked about the, um, the DNA of an earthworm was a hundred billion lines of computer code. I mean, to make an earthworm, I, there's an old Far Side cartoon, you cut the Far Side cartoons, with the caption, God makes the snake, and it shows, you know, the, you know, old man version of God doing Plato in his hands like this, but wee, these are easy. <clears throat> There's nothing easy even about an earthworm, and when you look out and you see the sunrise over the ocean and the breaking white caps and the tide coming and going, and it's predictable, I had the app on my phone, I could see when high tide was coming and where to put tent every day, 
And so the heavens declare clearly the glory of God. And the glory of God, again, the glory of the Lord built the temple. We talk about doing things for the glory of God, to the glory of God, by the glory of God. Um, you know, to, God is glorified, that is actually worthy of praise. And, and notice this, the glory of God. The Hebrew word God here is El. As Elohim, um, El Shaddai. There's lots of names of God in the Old Testament. And the El of the glory of God here is the same one that's used in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, later on, and we're going to get to that in the psalm as well, later on when Moses meets God and says, tell me your name, and he says, I am who am, you know, Yahweh, uh, that, that is when we get a proper noun name for God. The Holy of Holies that the Hebrews wouldn't even write out with vowels. Uh, but it's interesting that when he's talking about creation, David uses the word for the creator. Right? And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night after night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now once again, there's no speech, there are no words where this voice is not heard. And again, being, you know, by my friend Mark Swindoll, I say this every time I teach, I think. I, I use the same lines over and over and over again. I think repetition is important. Repetition is important. Repetition is important. You get the joke, yeah. Uh, but uh, I always use Mark's line that familiar scriptures must be read all the more carefully. But one of the most familiar scriptures is from Romans, and Romans chapter 1, where God is talking about nobody is without excuse. The Holy Spirit says through all, through what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. Anybody who looks at the ocean and looks at the sun and looks at the moon and looks at a tree in bloom and, and, and does not see a creator is without excuse because you have to be willfully blind and ignorant not to see a designer there. To think that an explosion would put all the parts together like that is to assume that a stick of dynamite in a General Motors factory would come together in the shape of a Buick. Actually, not a Buick, a Cadillac, because it's better than a Buick, right? Higher, higher in price? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, higher yeah. price, yes. Higher price, yes. Yeah, same, same chassis these days. So, again, there's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. The, the voice of God speaking in nature is absolutely obvious to anybody with eyeballs. And then, their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And again, later on in Romans, you know, Paul is writing in a different context, uh, and this, this comes after you know, faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word of God is the, the previous line. He says, but have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice, the word of God, has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So, yeah, this quote, this Psalm is being quoted when Paul talks about the Word of God. Yeah, now he's talking about the revealed Word of God in Scripture and the revealed living Word of God in Jesus. But Paul, a well-educated Jew, you know, Pharisee of Pharisees, when he's asked the question, okay, how, how have they heard? They've heard the same way we've all heard. You can't miss the Word of God in nature. Thoughts on that before we go forward? It's one of the first couplets here, these first four verses. Any thoughts on God's creative power and majesty? I mean, even people that won't acknowledge God directly when they, all the cultures and things like that, when they look in the sky, they're overwhelmed by the power and majesty. They might assign it to the wrong things, but they're saying something is unbelievably powerful here. Okay, so they just don't bring themselves to say, God had to create this. Yeah, even, I mean, that's one of the arguments, again, to steal from across the way there in the, across the way there in the Lewis class, 
Uh, one of the arguments C.S. Lewis used to make um, you know, in, in Mere Christianity, uh, where he used the phrase that in Christ, myth became fact, that every culture and those that did not have the revealed word of God like the Jews did, but every culture, you know, Greeks and Romans and pagans and you know, animists and Hindus, I mean, everybody out there you know, has creation myths where God must have done, the gods must have done this, whether it be the, the Norse tree of life or, you know, or whatever. And then he then spent 600 years or so teaching one particular people exactly how he did it, and there's only one of him, so that later on when a guy shows up and says, I'm him, that can't possibly be because they're in your culture, and that's you know the one time when myth and fact intersect in Jerusalem where it matters. And, and all those myths just got you know whispering in the ears of the pagans. You can't avoid seeing this. Later on, I'm going to clear this up for you. And now we have the fullness of that. So, uh, still now talking about the uh, creative power of God. And then he said, A tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. And, and this is, again, the sun. How many cultures have worshipped the sun? Yeah, thinking, oh, that's got the sun god must be the big god. Apollo must be the good one. Helios. Uh, you know, but because the sun is the biggest and brightest thing up there, and, and once again, he, God, has created the sun, set it in motion. I'm sitting on that porch watching it do what it does every day, exactly like it always does, the way God made it happen. It's great evidence for his creative power. And moving forward, mm -hmm. then he switches and the noun changes. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And this is the Lord, the tetragrammaton, the four, four letters. We always see it as small caps. And that, that is, you know, we say YHWH, uh, the I am, who am. Uh, Yahweh, we usually say, even though we have no idea what actual vowels they threw in there. Uh, when you made that into the Vulgate Bible in Latin, um, because the Y becomes a J and the W becomes a V, you get Jehovah. Uh, but again, that's when, when Moses sees the burning bush and says, who are you? Shall I say, sent me? And God says, I am. And then later on, Jesus says in John, the 858, before Abraham was, I am. So we go from creator, and now we get the law of the Lord, the law of Moses in this case, but everything that God tells us to do is perfect. Now what's the law of the Lord do? What does the law of the Lord do? That would be an interrogative statement. It revives the soul. It revives the soul. And it makes wise the simple, right? The, the law of the Lord is perfect, and therefore it revives the soul. Revive my soul this weekend. <clears throat> the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Still pretty simple, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're told in other psalms and proverbs and ecclesiastes the wisdom literature then moving forward the precepts of the lord are right and that rejoices your heart and the commandment of the lord is pure which <laughs> got a camera <laughs> see it's my stream just like right all there into the face it enlightens the eyes so it rejoices the heart, enlightens the eyes. Does anybody think of a particular song if I say enlightens the eyes? Church song, not an 80 song. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, right? Isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians? And again, because I don't have a screen to work with and, and teeny tiny eyeballs, um, we don't have the whole thing. Remember, Paul says, I. I always remember you in, your, in my prayers, yeah, and my prayer for you is this. And notice about Paul, by the way, I don't want to leave this space down on the frame. Uh, so Paul, when he prays for people, 
You know, he never prays for their circumstances to change. He never prays in his written prayers in, in Scripture for somebody to be let out of prison or get better from being sick or win lotto or whatever. Yeah, it's always spiritual things he prays for. Now, that, I'm sure he did pray for those other things. Yeah, we, we know that the apostles all got together and the disciples and they prayed for Peter to be let out of prison, and sure enough, he was, and they were then shocked when he knocked on the door, which is kind of funny. I think I'm the same way, by the way. I, I pray for something and it happens. Whoa, imagine that, as if I didn't just talk to the most powerful you know, creator of the entire universe and he can't do anything he wants. Whoa, how about that? You answered. You know, yeah, 50 years in, and it's still like, hey, I'm still surprised at that. It's like, I'd like being surprised by Christmas. They haven't moved it. Yeah, but Paul says, I pray for you in this case that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened. Again, that you may know what is the hope which he has called you or the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then, you know how the rest of that one goes from your scriptures? That you may know deep, how deep and wide and high the love of the Lord is. Such a great passage. Yeah, but again, Paul in the New Testament is echoing exactly what David said in the Old Testament. Why do you think that is? Repetition. Pardon? Repetition. Repetition, repetition. And also, yeah, and Paul does know his psalms real well. It's also kind of funny, and it? it's almost like there was just one author. It's almost like somebody was cribbing here. Yeah, you know, cheating off the other guy's paper. Oh, come on! You must. Yeah. It, it, I was. I, this is so nerdy, and one part why I planned to say, but I, I was having this conversation with uh, my son's father-in-law, who vacationed with us. The in-laws came; they were great. Um, and um, somehow we got to talking about language. It was actually because um, playing Trivial Pursuit, and there was a question about the Brothers Grimm. And next thing you know, I'm off being pedantic. And uh, and the, in addition to writing the Grimm's fairy tales, we also <coughs> a linguist, and there's a there's something called Grimm's Law that shows how language evolves and how you get from, um, you know, pater in Latin to vater in German and father in England or in English. Uh, and somehow we were talking about linguistics for 15 minutes over a coffee table. Uh, but interestingly, we have this imaginary language, this imaginary people. We, we've got no evidence of them. But historians and linguists talk about Indo-European culture that must have existed because European languages and Sanskrit over in India developed so similarly and never saw each other. And the only way that you could have that kind of a family resemblance is if you had a common ancestor. Now again, those of us who are believers would say, well, there was that whole Tower of Babel thing, that might be something, you know, and we all do have a common ancestor, I mean, Noah, and you know, before that, others, uh, you know, but particularly Noah. Uh, and um, anybody that wasn't in the Noah line, you know, you know, so you're pretty sure you didn't come off of one of those other branches of the Adamic race. Uh, but, but still, these things are so similar because they've got a common parent. The author of all scripture is really the Holy Spirit. Am I right with, you know, with, with David's poetry or uh, Paul's stunning lack of humility, Peter's plain spokenness? Yeah, uh, but you know, or, or I predict love Moses. Moses' extreme humility. Moses says, "I'm the most humble man on earth." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you not. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And notice the argument now shifts. The law, first of all, does something for you. It brings benefits. But secondarily, even if it didn't bring benefits, really probably not secondarily, primarily, even if it didn't bring benefits, it also is true. Yeah, and that's really the more important part, right? I mean, I, I've heard the argument made before, and it's not a bad one necessarily, that even if Christianity weren't true, what Christianity has done, the number of you know, lives saved, hospitals built, orphanages run, yeah, so, so much, I mean, the, the freeing of the slaves by, you know, start, started off with William Wilberforce and his belief, rightly, that you know, all people are made in the image of God. And if you look at all of the great things that have been done by Christians, that even if this stuff 
weren't actually true, the benefits are worth it. What does Paul say about that? If there is no resurrection, we are the most in the world to be pitied, right? So, it's not just that it works, more importantly, it's true. Now, it works because it's true. Things that aren't true don't tend to work very well for very long. Yeah, but yeah, the fact is the law of the Lord is eternal and clean and righteous and true, and therefore it brings these benefits. Any other benefits of the law of the Lord? Pop to your mind? Any place else you could look to find more information about the law of the Lord? Any place you could look that is one digit added to this psalm to hear about the law of the Lord? Psalm 119, right? And psalm 119, what is the trivia question? What goes to Psalm 119? It is the... You can say that the longest. On the longest chapter in all the scripture. Yeah. If you're going to try to read four chapters a day, so you get the Bible in a year, and you get up to, oh, great, I got Psalm 119. It's going to be a long day. Put 117 with it. Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's like, uh, like back when I was a track coach, saying, all right, boys, we're going to take, take a little break right now before we hit the big one. <laughs> Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in all scripture. Hundreds of verses, 158, I think it is. And everyone, it goes through the entire Hebrew alphabet. You have eight verse couplets with all 26 letters about the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord. The of the Lord and an entire meditation on what the law of the Lord is good for. It, you know, it is, it, it makes you wise, it makes you powerful, it makes you pure. It, it brings relief, it brings joy, it brings healing, um, it helps you to secure your heart against sin, all of those things. And the law of the Lord, you know, we've gone from creation is amazing, and then the law is amazing. More to be desired are they, that is the law of the Lord, than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Once again, we keep on playing this game, which apparently I don't have enough contestants on my game show today. Yeah, help me out. Um, wh where else do we see language like this, where you hear things being finer than gold, sweeter than honey, dripping like a honeycomb? What, what else is finer than gold, sweeter than honey, more precious than rubies? Solomon says it. Wisdom. Yeah, you, you get into into the book of Proverbs, particularly chapters one and three and eight, and uh, and, and Solomon, you know, has this discourse on wisdom and above all else, seek wisdom. Wisdom is more precious than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, dripping like honey from the comb. And again, in keeping them, there's great reward. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Wisdom is good because it's true. Precious because it's good and true. Oh, and by the way, it works. And once again, it's almost like there's the same author, David and Solomon and Paul and everywhere else in Scripture. You guys, you know, 66 books over 1,600 years. I think 33 authors. And somehow... People have been trying to find contradictions in that for 2,500 years, and they've not been able to do it. That's pretty doggone good editing. The Holy Spirit is a really good copy editor. All right, moving forward. So who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So, first of all, who can discern his own errors? Which, which of us can really figure out on our own if I'm doing it right? No? Yeah, that's, that's the rhetorical question. Is any of us really able to be the judge of ourselves? 
And we, even if we are the judge of ourselves, sometimes we allow ourselves to do things that are willful sins, right? When he gets into the thing of uh, keep your servant from willful sin. Absolutely. Even those of us, even the best of us, even the most mature of us, yeah, still don't have eyes that can really penetrate our own hearts and can really know for sure if we are properly keeping the law of God. We can try as hard as we can, but we also, you know, we might fall into hidden faults and we also might commit presumptuous sins. What's the difference? When he says to remember innocent from hidden faults, how is that different than presumptuous sins? Of course, we like to we like to justify our mistakes. Some somebody once told me they said we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions and other people by their actions. So back to discerning our errors. Well, but my motive was this, you know. Um, but hidden faults could be one of two. Uh, they can be ones that. Um, we are hiding from others, but they, or they can be ones that we've hidden from ourselves that we just don't even realize absolutely. Uh, what we're doing okay. that a is wrong. Yeah, ab absolutely. So they may be hidden even from us. I mean, they may be, I mean, go back to the ancient Hebrews, right? And they would <coughs> have the sin offering and the guilt offering, and people can sin and not even know it yeah, because we do not perfectly know or perfectly keep the law despite our best efforts. Um, I saw a cartoon, again, I see a lot of silly cartoons, uh, but, uh, uh, but it was a cartoon and it was meant to be snarky and um, uh, it's a little child sitting on the knee of Jesus and the captain says, Lord, why is it just you and me here in heaven? And Jesus answers, well, apparently, everybody else's theology was just a little bit off. I, I am pretty sure, pretty sure that my own personal theology and the things I believe about God, that something in there is probably wrong. I just don't know which one it is. If I knew, I'd fix it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was reading a mystery novel on the beach, and, and uh, uh, some, somebody asked the hero, uh, do you remember beating up so-and-so? Uh, and um, yeah, that led into a whole discourse of like, I never heard of him. It's like, I can't remember something I forgot. If I told you I don't remember it, I'm not going to give you any more details than that. If I knew, then I'd be lying. Since I'm not lying, I obviously don't know, right? And so I don't know where I'm wrong. I just assume that since I'm not perfect, I must be. Which also means if I find out later on where I'm wrong, I'm obligated to fix that and not just keep on doing what I've been doing for the sake of a foolish consistency, right? <laughs> but even from ourselves, faults can be hidden. Now, how's that different from presumptuous sins? You've decided that his law doesn't apply to you for some reason, um, and you're just going to do it. Bingo, exactly. And, and that's the one that you can do something about. Like, you know, I, you know, when you say, you know, I know this is sin, I'll do it anyway. Yeah, now that's, again, the bad kind, if you will. That's the mortal sin. That, that's the sin of pride that I'll be my own God. You may not be saying it to yourself in so many words, but I'm not perfectly keeping the law because I don't understand it, yeah, you know, because I don't know it, yeah, because I can't help myself, because I'm really just a, you know, an animal with a bad haircut. Um, yeah, all, all of those things are possibilities, but when I know what the will of God is and choose not to do it because I want to be the boss of me, that's something entirely different, right? Now, even that, and even the best of us, don't get it 100% perfect, do we? If you think about it, yeah. You can say, please let them not have dominion over me, right? We talk about strongholds, and, and, and again, that's a, I, I'm not sure if that's exactly what Paul was talking about when he talked about we, you know, we have the mind of Christ to conquer strongholds. Uh, but in many, many sermons for the past thousand years or so, we've referred to strongholds as being particular sins, addictions, 
uh, habits of mind or art that get in there and are very, very hard to worm out. And they have dominion over you. Paul talks about being a slave to sin as long as you're in the flesh or a slave to righteousness if you're in the spirit. And I'll be blameless and innocent and nothing will have dominion over me. If what? How, what, what do we know is the actual key to that equation? Trusting in God and going back to God. Yes. And the blood of Jesus, right? Trusting in God, yes. But I do not have it in myself not to sin. Right. And even if I get really, really, really good at it, I still... I mean, if, I, if I get a 99.94 you know, ivory soap, I know, what, four, four, ivory soap level of, of perfection, is that, is that holy? No. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all need Jesus, and particularly this dude. All right. So I can't even discern my own errors. I can look at the sky and say, wow, there's a creator and it's not me. I can realize because that creator is not me that his law must be perfect. I can see all the benefits of keeping his law. I can believe it to be 100% true. It can give me more wisdom than the average bear boo-boo. More cartoons. And still, can't do it all by myself. Yeah, we can't truly be innocent, truly be blameless, truly be clean, except for the blood of Jesus. But because of the blood of Jesus, we, we can be all of those things. God can impute that to us in spite of our own failures. Which is why, although I do believe I'm probably wrong about something, I'm not freaked out by it. Again, if I find out what it is, if in my daily time in the Word, something appeared, oh, well, I've been wrong about that for 20 years. And that's happened, by the way. It's been kind of like, whoa, I... Never read it that way before, and now I see clearly. I mean, I'm, that there are things I've preached from pulpits that I wish I'd never said now, based on uh, what I think is a clearer understanding of Scripture. Um, but I can repent of that, and it's not going to be like that cartoon where Jesus says, "Oh, you're one percent off in your theology. You got your Christology partly wrong. Your mental image of God was not quite right." Hey, if you knew more Latin, you'd know there was a heresy about that in the fifth century, and you've bought into it. No, none of those things actually matter. Do you know my son? Yes. Is he Lord of your life? Yes. How, how do you know that? Well, because I was buried with him in baptism and rose to walk in his life, and my sins were washed away, and now it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. It's good to be the king. It's good to be the son of the king. Yes, sir. And back in 13 there, um, this, this is, again, without the blood of Jesus, even without... You know, being kept from the deliberate, willful, presumptuous sins so they don't have dominion, I can be blameless. I'm still only innocent of great transgression. I'm yes. still screwing up. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm only innocent. That just keeps me away from the big stuff. Yeah, only innocent of great transgression. There's still little transgressions all the time. Hmm? And, and again, and that's, that's where you have to, yeah, again, read Scripture carefully. Oh, cool, I'm all covered. I'll do anything I want. Shall we sin more that grace may abound? Grace is such a good thing. I'll just throw myself on God's grace and live exactly how I choose to. Is that, yeah. well, what does Romans 6 say about that? Shall we sin more that grace may abound? By no means. How can you who have died to sin be enslaved by it? And live in it. Almost like there's just one author of all of this. Almost like every question that we could ask has already been answered. Almost like you know, we've been really, really well prepared with what it takes to understand and keep the law of the Lord adequately because what the law really does is drive us in the arms of Jesus. Now, I'm going to shift gears for a second. I'll come back and finish in a minute. But, uh, so, I didn't go this deep into it, of course. We had our Sunday morning devotional. And David's father-in-law, Sam, he's uh, an elder at uh, their church in McCrory, Arkansas. McCrory, Arkansas is so small that if you climb the swing set in McCrory Elementary School, you can see the whole town from there. That is not a joke. Uh, when we stayed there for David's graduation from Harding, which is longer ago than I'd like to admit, um, 
uh, we, uh, there's a hotel, and we stayed in the house of the high school principal who left the key because he'd gone hunting. And we walked to church, <clears throat> and we um, walked to Sam and Lisa's house, and, our, and the principal's house backed up on the football field of Recorey High School. And um, I thought to myself, oh, how convenient that is. But boy, it'll be terrible if the lights are on. And I thought, wait a second. If the stadium lights are on, this guy's working. He turns them off before he goes home. He has a great backyard that somebody else cuts and strikes. It looks like a football field. But he never has to worry about the lights being on when he's awake. Because if they're on, he's awake. That's kind of, kind of fun. But yeah, before he's a tiny little town, tiny little church. And Sam and I, and we, yeah, he comes out on the porch and I'm doing my Bible reading. He says, hey, I was thinking Sunday we, um, uh, we, we should have a devotional. So I was thinking the same thing. I've actually prepared a little something from Psalm 19 this morning. He said, well, that's good. I've got mine too. So we'll just, we'll tag team it. So we had communion. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, I forgot to steal eight communion cups from church. I meant to do it. And, and, um, yeah, and Sam's wife, Lisa, reached into the bag and says, we got them. I said, oh, thank goodness. She goes, oh yeah, your wife told me to. <laughs> That's why I always had that watch. We all had the great ideas, but we really didn't put these things into, 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 uh, into work. And he was also reading the Lagarde Smith narrative Bible. So we had the same reading that morning, and this was the reading, and it's, it's blah, 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 very small where you're sitting. But I, I want to point this out because he, the, what he thought of, he read from Lagarde Smith's devotional reading. Uh, he had a secondary book to go along with the scripture reading. And, and this is from 2 Chronicles 17 to 20 which was in the daily Bible reading from that day, which was July 3rd. Uh, and so this is a story now from Hezekiah, yeah, from, from Second Chronicles, but about Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah was a reformer. He's one of the good kings, one of the very few good kings of Judah. And he pretty much puts everything all the way back again. <clears throat> and um, he says, but they, so now they're going to celebrate the Passover. And there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves Therefore, the Levites had slaughtered the popular land for everyone who was not clean, because there weren't enough priests. And for a majority of the people, many of them, the Levites, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Zechariah, and Zebulun, they did not cleanse themselves. Yet they ate the Passover anyway, otherwise than as prescribed, because Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek God, the Lord, the God of his Father even though not according to the sanctuary's rules of cleanness. And the Lord had heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Now again, I had in my head since dawn this meditation on the perfection of the law of the Lord. And then Sam's reading that day was on this, and the little guard Smith devotional reading had to go along with it, pointed out that, please note, the law was never set aside here. But Hezekiah, a good and mature leader of people who dearly love the Lord, you know, prayed to God that they just want to keep the Passover. We're not going to do this all the time, but may I please meet these people where they are. And God did not strike anybody down. This is the same God that when, you know, us touched the earth, boom, you know. So, when, when the sons of the high priest, you know, showed up drunk and messing around, he zapped them. So this is the same God that, that smites when smiting is called for. But we, like children, we learn early in our Christian walk what the rules are. And then, like young adults, we learn to keep them and make it habitual. I was a coach for all those years. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. And then, as adults, and especially as mature adults, we learn what's behind the rules. Not that the rules don't matter. The rules matter because of what's behind the rules. And does anybody remember Michael Johnson, the, the gold medalist or sprinter that I mean, set the world record in the 400 and 200? And you know, it was what. Well, he was my favorite back in the day. And Michael Johnson runs ugly. He ran leaning back. It, it was the funniest thing. Every other sprinter is forward, and Michael Johnson's posture is all wrong. And he was the fastest man in the whole world at one time. 
Now records remain to be broken, so, so he, um, there's a guy named Usain Bolt came along and now Michael Johnson's a footnote. But even Usain Bolt comes out of starting blocks all wrong. Not like a high school coach would teach a 14-year-old freshman. Anybody here like jazz? So what must you be able to do before you can improvise? Yeah. You have to know the music really, really, really well. Until you can play every note like you should, you don't get the freedom to, hey, y'all, watch this and syncopate and improvise. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that analogy falls a little bit flat because we never get mature enough where we get to write our own rules over and above God's rules. But part of maturity is being able to know where a, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a 12-year-old needs to just follow the rules. Right? And, and when I was a brand new driver, <clears throat> yeah, just leave earlier and be on time. There is no excuse for breaking your curfew. If there was a hurricane, you should have made a hurricane plan. Yeah. But yeah, as you become more and more of a trustworthy driver, why are you late? There was a wreck on 61, I had to go 17. I left in plenty of time. Yeah, I wanted to be safe. I wanted to not tear up your car. Okay. It's different as you become more mature. Okay, so this is not an excuse for how we get to get around the rules of God, but as Hezekiah prays, the law of the Lord is perfect and true. It has all these benefits. But it's not about legalism. It's not about shackles. God gives us these things because he loves us and he wants what's best for us. And doing it his way is what's best for us. Thoughts on that? And then it ends with more layer scripture. It, it's com comforting. But... It's incredibly comforting. It's not, it's not meant to be like, oh, great, so when do I get my, I got my AARP card a while back, you know? It's like, hey, congratulations, you're old now. Yeah, you don't get your Titus II card, congratulations, you're one of the old men who gets to teach the young men. Yeah, but maturity, you don't get a, you know, there's, there's not an, I mean, there may be an age of legal accountability, now you can drive a car, now you can vote, but there's not one, to ching suddenly you're a mature Christian. And again, humility says that we should all say, I'm not that mature a Christian, not enough. I, I won't be mature enough on the day I meet my maker. But at some point, yeah, it's comforting. It's not meant to be, oh, that's confusing. I just missed the rules. Like that James Bond movie where um, M says, I missed the Cold War. Which is nice, no one worthy of anyone was. You know? So confusing now, it's more complicated. No, I mean, it's not more complicated, it's more relational because we're God's children. And, and and knowing how good God is and how good his law is and how good his law is for us, we want to follow it for all the right reasons and not because we have to. And David finishes, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Again, familiar scriptures. Um, we pray that a lot. We make that into a prayer. Uh, I like the fact that Lynn tends to, when he preaches, use that before he preaches. Um, uh, and uh, again, very, very famous scriptures, and this is where it comes from. There. Psalm 19, 14 verses, and so powerful. Thoughts, comments, questions, hassles? <clears throat> That's the last piece you had there about being comforting, but God's word intending them to do that, right? It reminded me of when I was a kid, or younger, we used to have all these stupid conversations about what would happen <clears throat> if this person was going to be baptized. And even as you cross in the street, you got to buy a truck. Mm -hmm. And we would sit around. It, that's kind of exactly the heart of what that scripture's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Oh, absolutely. That that hypothetical bus has run over more Christians on the way to the baptistry. We've all had that conversation, haven't we? And, and that's like, okay, what if you were on your way to get baptized? You got run over by a bus. And that, there's a lot of Christians under that bus because every one of us has probably wondered about that same thing. Yeah. But, the, but that lesson that comes out there is God's. His will is important, right? There's no doubt about it. But also, uh, grace is there too. Uh, Francis Chan, the guy that wrote Crazy Love, all had a guy with really long fingers, by the way. You'll notice when he does his gesticulations on films, like, my hands are huge. Uh, but uh, I love his preaching. And he had a great sermon. You can find it on YouTube. Just you know, type in, like, Francis Chan, Baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
And after he was like doing a two day series or something, and he talked about be baptized through the Holy Spirit. And he said, I got some questions yesterday about why and how, and like, so when, when do you actually get saved, and how does this all work? And, um, and he said, my question back at you is, why do you ask? The word says, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have an academic question of like, when, okay, we, we can have a great study about how and all, how and why and what theologians think and all this stuff, but if you're just looking for an excuse not to do what Scripture clearly says, then you're asking the wrong question for the wrong reason. God says, be baptized, receive the Spirit. So be baptized, receive the Spirit. I don't care if you're baptized, never see the Spirit, receive the Spirit, then are baptized, happens at the same time, happens in the same week, you know. If God says, do it, I do it, because he's God and I'm not. Yes, sir? My response to that Situations that we need to be humble before the word. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be humble before the word. Why are you asking? Because God's word is pure and revives the soul and is perfect and is true. So just do what he says. If you're looking for some wiggle room, that's not how it works. By the way, that Lagarde Smith passage and this Lagarde Smith Bible that um, Ken and I are, and others are, are reading this year. Uh, Lagarde Smith wrote a great book. I think it's my favorite book on baptism that I've read. And it's called Baptism, the Believer's Wedding Ceremony. And he talks about how baptism is much like a wedding in that way. And he, and he asks that same hypothetical. Well, what if you were shipwrecked and you and your beloved were on a desert island and there was no church and there was no preacher and there was no ceremony? Could you live together as man and wife as God intended like Adam and Eve in the garden? And the answer is, well, of course you could. But if you were rescued by a cruise ship, the very first thing you would do once you got on board is you would say, hey, Captain, let's go to deck four and have a ceremony because my beloved wants one, and I love her, and I would not deny her what she wants because, oh, well, we've already been together all this time, or that's not really necessary. Would you say to the one you really love, I want, you want this thing, it's in my power to give it, and I just don't think your desires are that important, so I choose not to love you. So the necessity of baptism, again, it's legalism, it's love. God says, do it, I love him, I do it. Is there some crazy hit by a bus scenario where maybe it doesn't work? God's God, I'm not, that's where humility comes in. But as long as it's up to me, I'm gonna do what God asks me, tells me to do, because the heavens declare the glory of God. And there's no excuse not to. That's where we're done. Just in time, we'll go across. Let's pray and then we'll yeah, go into worship together. Our Father, we thank you for this day and for this church family. We thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together in love, to be instructed from your word, you know, to have what David didn't have and what Paul didn't have, which is the totality of Scripture. And, and Father, we thank you for revealing to us, you know, what you know, even ancient prophets didn't have, the, the, the glory of your Son and his mercy and his love and also his justice and his power. And Father, we just thank you so much that you've seen fit to adopt us through him into your family, to make us, you know, not just servants but sons and daughters. And we thank you that now we get to go and sing praise to your name because you really are worthy of all glory and honor and to you know, give of our means, to partake the Lord's Supper, and to remember what you've done for us, and, and, and to celebrate together being in this relationship. And Father, just uh, bless this congregation, bless this family, you know, bless the preaching and teaching today, and singing all the things we do that will bring glory to you and we'll us closer together in your name.